This morning, I would like to talk to you about a region in this nation that is developing technologies that are so profound that their implementation will change the course of humankind. Now, you may think that I'm talking about Silicon Valley, but I'm not. Although there are parallels between Silicon Valley and the region of which I'm about to speak, <clears throat> I think we should explore those parallels. Who started Silicon Valley anyway? Well, in 1947, this fellow, William Shockley, was working for Bell Laboratories out in New Jersey. He and two other very bright physicists came up with an invention called the transistor, which he would later win the Nobel Prize for. In 1955, Mr. Shockley decided it was time to leave Bell Labs and head back to his hometown of Mountain View, California, and set up shop. Now, Mountain View, California, in 1955, was nothing special. In 1955, Mountain View, California was composed of small farms and orchards, and the main street of this town was more or less a wide spot in the road. There were less than 10,000 people living there. They had no long-distance telephone service, for example. Nevertheless, Mr. Shockley decided he was going to go home and set up shop there. He got some investors. He worked with a fellow named Mr. Beckman. And he set up his laboratory in, in Mountain View. And his next job was to go to recruit people to help fill out his staff to help him commercialize these amazing inventions. Well, he pretty rapidly discovered that's not so easy in a place like Mountain View, California in 1955. All of the folks with whom he worked, the brilliant scientists and physicists that he worked with, none of them wanted to go to this wide spot in the road in California. What was really happening was happening in New York and Boston and Philadelphia. So he lowered his sights a little bit, and he instead went after the best and brightest college graduates he could find. And he was able to scrape together about a dozen of these folks to help start his lab. Well, it became pretty clear to these folks after about a year, by 1957, that Mr. Shockley, although a great physicist, was a terrible leader. And the technologies that he was so focused on were not the technologies that were currently shaping the country. Eight of these people decided that they would convince Mr. Shockley to change direction, but he was intransient, and he would not change direction. So in 1957, eight of these folks broke off from Shockley Labs and, to a large extent, were responsible for the first failure in Silicon Valley because a couple years later, Mr. Shockley went belly up. These eight folks went out looking for uh, some investors. Um, they were able to find one in the form of Mr. Sherman Fairchild from Long Island. And Mr. Fairchild helped them set up Fairchild Semiconductors. Here you see Mr. Noyce and Mr. Moore uh, speaking with Mr. Fairchild. Now, this made Mr. Shockley a little bit upset. He called these folks the traitorous eight. But the traitorous eight went on to do many, many great things out in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley itself was named by a journalist in 1971 who wrote a bunch of exposés. He hung out in the local bars in Silicon Valley, and he got all the scoop he could. And then he wrote this, this publication about what, who was hiring, who wasn't hiring, what was a good place to work, what was a bad place to work. Uh, Fairchild forbade their employees from going to these bars, but he coined a phrase not Santa Clara Valley, but Silicon Valley, and it's stuck. So today, Silicon Valley is, is the moniker that was, was put together by this journalist in 1971. Well, the interesting thing about this is Fairchild spawned a whole bunch of fair children. So by 1971, more than two dozen companies had been spawned by the treacherous eight that left, uh, left Mr. Shockley. So the takeaway from this whole exercise is that great companies can start in challenging and unlikely places. So let's talk about some challenging and unlikely places. Fargo, North Dakota could be con considered one of these challenging and unlikely places. And what was happening here about the time that Mr. Shockley uh, was doing his work in California? Well, in 1956, there were two brothers in Rossi, Minnesota, 
who were approached by some local farmers. The farmers had a problem, simple problem, cleaning out their dairy barns. And it was, it was a dirty and dangerous and dull task, and they were trying to find some mechanization to do that job for them. Well, these Keller brothers decided they could make a very strong, nimble machine that could go into these tight places and could clean out these barns. Fast forward 60 years, and you have Bobcat. Bobcat now, today, is, is the market leader in a machine whose genesis was in 1956. And this industry is a multi-billion dollar worldwide industry. The skid steer loader never existed before the Keller brothers got involved. About the same time, two brothers up in Red Wing, <coughs> pardon me, Red Lake Falls, Minnesota, the Steiger brothers, were approaching this problem from a different angle. They were trying to solve the high horsepower problem. Farmers at this time were getting larger, they needed to be better equipped, they needed to have better efficiencies, and so they were looking for high horsepower tractors to move their implements through the fields, and they weren't available at that time. So these two guys got together, and they made this behemoth of a machine and started building them in their barn. The same people who started Bobcat by this time had sold Bobcat to Clark, and they got involved with the Steiger brothers up in Red Lake Falls, Minnesota, and today we have Steiger Tractor owned by Case IH. This is a $25 billion worldwide all-wheel drive market. In 1987, some engineers that worked for Steiger Tractor, about the time that Steiger was going to be purchased by Case IH, like, like the Trader S8, decided to leave the company Steiger Tractor and strike out on their own and start their own business. This house in West Fargo was the incubator. It was here that the first designs took place for a company that would become known as Phoenix International. Phoenix International grew to 1999, was acquired by John Deere, and today is John Deere Electronic Services, that has 1,000 people or more employed worldwide in the development of highly intelligent equipment that makes machines smarter and more productive. Following the acquisition of Phoenix International by John Deere, one of those engineers struck out again and started a new business called Apario System. That business, the first digital data flight recorders, which are now part of every Airbus helicopter made, were designed in the basement of this home. Today, that company in the research park has hundreds of engineers and has a worldwide presence as designing advanced technologies that are embedded in mobile equipment. So what's the takeaway here? The takeaway here is that a few entrepreneurs can make a large impact. We've seen this chart before, but it's interesting now that other region in the United States I talked about that is creating profound technologies is right here. The genesis of this was Bobcat Corporation. Bobcat Corporation spawned Steiger Tractor, Steiger Tractor spawned Phoenix International, and so on and so forth. And here today we have dozens of companies, thousands of employees from this genesis of, of corporations here in the United States. The takeaway here is there's a framework for success in Fargo that new leaders can build upon. We are now in a situation where the world is growing rapidly. Today there's 7.6 billion people here. Very soon, by 2050, there's going to be almost 10 billion people. And guess what? They want to eat. The gap that is, exists today is about 60% between the foods we build today and the foods that will be needed at that time. We've gone a long way in genetic engineering. It's very helpful, and it continues to help us. The mechanization of agriculture and the automation of agriculture is the next step. The ability for these machines to become thoughtful, thinking, high-speed machines will change the picture in the production of agriculture worldwide. These machines can do everything from picking strawberries to planting corn seeds one seed at a time. Currently, farming is run by men, homo sapiens. Homo sapiens are wise men. In the future, farming will be run by robota sentience or Robosentian. Robo is a, is a term that comes from the Czechoslovakian firm term robata. Sentient is to sense and to feel. This is the future and it's being developed right here in the Red River Valley. So I would like to be the first to welcome all of you to Robosentian Valley. Thank you very much.